funny, wasn't it? Amen? Golly. That doesn't touch you. You have no toucher. Amen. Hey. I got a letter here uh, from somebody, just a little note, and I thought I'd share it with you. To Grace Point, we wish to send and the enclosed contributions to repay what we can for our spiritual food from watching your videos on YouTube. John and I met in Church of Christ where I was attending with my husband of 53 years who had passed away. His wife, 58 years, passed away about the same time. We married just before COVID came on the scene. I kept my name simplified paperwork. My mother, grandparents, and other family members had all, all our lives believed in the Church of Christ was the only right church. It has been so hard for me to understand how we could have missed what the Bible is really teaching. John and I were an encouragement uh, to each other to search the scriptures. We're thankful for uh, Pastor Jim, Les Feldick, Brother Breaker, and others helping teach us. We uh, are out in the country with no true congregation anywhere near us. Your Sunday program is our church and we appreciate you very much. That was from John and Rose. Wasn't that good? And they sent a gift of $250 to the church. And so we're so appreciative of that. But more than that, we're more appreciative of the fact that uh, they're watching our program. Amen. And uh, the title of my message this morning is, At Times It's Good to Remember Some Truths. At times, it's good to remember some truth. If you have your Bibles, you can turn in to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And the Apostle Paul, he comes to them, and he wants them to know where they were before their salvation. He wanted to know them to know where they are now, being in Christ, and what their future will be. That's Ephesians chapter 2. It's a good to step back once in a while and consider how God is so wonderful. And God is wonderful. And I think we take our salvation too, uh, just for granted too often. And uh, we say, well, yeah, I'm saved. You have to understand everything that brought this about prior to it. And I think Paul does a good job here. First of all, he talks to them about the past, the past. Chapter 2, verse 1 says this here, chapter Ephesians 2, 1. And you hath he quickened, made alive, resurrected spiritually, who were dead in trespasses and sins. That verse right there shows us we were spiritually dead. We had no spiritual life, no zoe the love life of Christ living in us. We didn't have that. At that time when we were lost, we could not spiritually see, hear, or understand, or grasp the truth of God. It's as if the word of God was a foreign language to us. I remember the first time I read the Bible, I said, well, there's the book of Job. You know, you just... I didn't know about the these, the thous, and... And a lot of things, and it was difficult for me uh, because of my background in, in having poor English. And so to begin to study the Bible, it was I just couldn't grasp it at that time. I couldn't comprehend it. It made very little sense to me at the beginning. And the, the natural man receiveth not the things of God, for they are foolishness unto him. So you can't comprehend it without the Spirit of God. Amen? And our behavior as a result of that reflected that truth. We lived in darkness and our deeds were dark. Uh, the God of this world had blinded us, right? And so we went by the way that he wanted us to go. Adam's sin was ingrained, ingrained in our nature. It was placed in our DNA from the time we were born. And as a result of that, our lives conformed and proved that we were sinners. We sinned habitually because we were born sinners. Sinners do what comes naturally. They 
they sin, okay? A man said to a preacher, doesn't it make you nervous preaching on sin with all those experts out there sitting in the congregation? <laughs> You'll get that one later on, okay? That's for all of us. Interestingly, there is hardly a word from Genesis 3, from that time of the fall, to Romans chapter 5 about Adam's sin being the cause of sin and death universally. That actually was not taught to its degree until the apostle Paul came on the scene. As a matter of fact, Jesus, during his three years of ministry, he never revealed this about Adam and his sin passing on and so on to his 12 apostles. It was Paul, the apostle to us, the body of Christ, the Gentiles, that he said in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world through him, and death by sin, and so death passed Upon all, who? Upon all men, for that all have sinned. And so Paul begins to explain about that first Adam. And since we're born in that first Adam, we take on his nature, which is a sinful nature, because he had sinned. Then in verse 2, the first part of verse 2, he says this here. In time past, you walked according to the course of this world. That little phrase right there is showing that we were controlled, molded by this world system. We live in an evil world system. Paul did. Every generation does. Galatians 1.4 says this here, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us, where? From this present evil world. Even in Paul's time, this world has always been evil. There's only certain things that's been a deterrent to evil from being full blast. And I believe that's the gospel light. The world's ungodly system of humanism, atheism, evolution, socialism, immorality, self selfishness, man's idolatry, man's wisdom, all those things opposed to God's absolute truth. And what it does, it allures to attractions to get man to come to the point of, self, of being self-love dominated. Today they promote who I am. I'm finding out who, oh, I love myself. Is that not true? You see it on TV all the time. I'm just finding out who I am and I love myself. This world has an agenda for people's lifestyles, their marriages, their kids, and they're forcing this through education and government force. And they're trying to mold us into their ways. And their ways are, according to this world, evil. That's what we just read. Paul said this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. In other words, don't allow the world to mold you into the way the world thinks and lives. You be your own self in Christ. That's who he wants us to be. Then chapter 2, verse 2, part of the verse says this, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? That's Satan. That's the devil. He's the god of this world, and he's the prince of the power of the air. He has a place in the second heaven. And that phrase is showing us we're controlled by the devil. We constantly have been led by him. We've been trapped, fooled, tricked, tempted, duped, lied to, to follow his ways. He draws us and tries to get us to be rebellious and disobedient to God and to other authority. That's why he said in that verse 2 there, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So he tries to get us to be that. Now, do we understand how successful the devil has been and is being today? 
The devil has left a trail of human destruction. The devil has turned the truth of God into a lie. Man worships man. Man serves mankind. And he also worships the earth more than God. Romans 1.25 says this here, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and served the creature more than the creator. And we're seeing that today through Mother Earth. It's just a repeat of what really happened back then. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 10.20. He said, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. They can worship all those things, but that's of the devil. And don't worry about climate change. Don't be fooled by that. I don't care if it goes up a couple of degrees. Don't worry about it. We've read the end of the book. We will be here. The earth will be here. Amen? I mean, it's right there in front of us. But the devil's goal is to prevent God from repossession of the earth. And he's trying to use man's help. And he always has. He used man to kill evil. He used his own fallen spirits to go into the daughters of men. And that's why God destroyed the earth by a flood. He used men to build the Tower of Babel to worship what they had done toward the heavens. He's had a war on Israel all of these years, and there's still anti-Semitism even today in there. And then, not only that, he used the leaders of Israel to crucify their own Messiah. And even today, the devil, he is relentless. He's angry at us. He attacks the body of Christ repeatedly. He doesn't give up. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3 then says this here, the first part of that verse. We all had our conversation, behavior, in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and mind. That part there is showing us we repeatedly yielded in time past to our flesh. Our flesh agreed with most of the temptations that came our way. Our flesh desires and has little resistance to block it. The flesh was unchecked in our life, free to act of itself. We know that the flesh has a propensity to sin. Our flesh is our number one enemy, and it longs and craves to fulfill its passions. That's within every person. Our evil imaginations, he says the mind there, were unloosed back then, having hardly any boundary. If our thoughts gave, come out, it would give our souls or our spirit, our body, direction. We would often act out what we are thinking. As a man thinketh, so is he. Genesis 6, 5 says this, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's without God. America's removed God's absolute truth. They've removed godly morals. And that has caused an unchecked depravity to be unleashed. Whatever the flesh desires is now the norm. Anybody see the Grammys? Disney's cartoons that's promoting transgenderism and stuff. Media, education. Everything today is excused or accepted. Then verse 3, he says this here, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We were controlled by our old nature. The police, the law, was the only thing that prevented our nature from complete lawlessness. 
But today, depravity is becoming more bold <clears throat> because today a lot of our government people are laxing law's punishment. They have a thing called catch and release. And the one guy was saying, with well, all he's handcuffed, I'll be out of jail before you get home tonight. And that's true. Society says man is not evil or sinful, but he is sick. He's a victim of his parents, of his environment, of his circumstances, because of his DNA. So as a result of that, man is not responsible nor wrong for his sinful actions. So man's wicked nature of wrath then is allowed by society and no consequences are required because of those actions. And then Paul says, now this is a past, but I want to tell you about the real past. And he kind of shifts in the further verses, Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past, what? Gentiles in the flesh who are called who? Uncircumcision, Gentiles, by that which is called the circumcision by the Jews in the flesh made by hands. That at that time in the past, you were without Christ and so on. Now notice, I'm going to break that down in that verse that at that time you were without Christ. As Gentiles in the past, they were ethnically excluded from truth. They had no promise of a God who would be a Savior. If a Gentile ever got saved, they had to humble themselves, convert, proselyte over to Judaism, and go through Israel in order to be saved. Just Gentiles out on their own, there was no way. After the Tower of Babel, everything then centered around Israel. When God in Genesis 12 called out Abraham, all mankind were pagan, idolatrous Gentiles. So God created a people, a nation called Israel, to be his very own. And when God did that, that left the Gentiles in a real disadvantage. The Gentile world hardly ever would hear God's truth unless they got around a Jewish person. But the majority of people of Gentiles around the world remained lost. And there became a barrier between the people of Israel and the entire world of Gentiles. The Jews said they're dogs. Gentiles called them names. Created a real division among Jewish people and the Gentiles. As Gentiles, the past, Christ was not presented to them because Jews didn't like him. And being lost, they had no hope of a Savior. In time past, they were not a part of God's purpose, plan, and program. Not a part whatsoever. Being, then he says in verse 12, <clears throat> I, I promise this will make sense before I'm over. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, that's past Gentiles. They were excluded from God's favored nation blessings. They were not allowed to participate. They had no access, no word, no home, no place with God. And as Gentiles, they were without citizen rights because only Israel had a contract with Almighty God. As the Gentiles are out, here's this little group of people. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says this. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. Now get this. Above all people 
that are, uh, are up on the face of the earth. Israel is the center of life. If anybody ever wants to have that God, they're going to have to come to Israel. And then he says in verse 7, For what nation is there so great? Israel. Who hath God so nigh unto them? As the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for. Can you see the relationship with Israel? But yet, Gentiles are out. But don't forget this. The Gentiles had their chance. The Gentiles had their choice. But because of their sin and unbelief, their choice was they rejected God. They rejected him in Genesis 6. God destroyed the world by a flood. They rejected him at the Tower of Babel. Gentiles said, we don't want this God. We want to make our own God. So God says, I don't have anybody to worship me, the one who created everything. So he said, okay, Gentiles, you're out. I'm going to raise me a people and a nation who will love me. And he raised up Israel. Then back to chapter 2, verse 12, a phrase he uses, and strangers from the covenants of promise. Israel had Abraham, Isaac, Jacob promises, and that gave them hope, assurance, purpose, faith. But the Gentiles had nothing. Their own fault, but they had nothing. A covenant is where God binds himself to carry out his personal promises to the Jewish people. God does not, never has, make covenants with Gentiles. Only Israel has covenants. And then chapter 2, verse 12, he says, having no hope. To a Gentile, there's no sadder words than that. Gentiles had no expectation, only disadvantages, nowhere to turn to, void of hope. All Gentiles could not expect God to be there for them. All they looked forward was God's going to judge them one day. As they enter hell, no exits, no mercy, no water, no relief, no hope. That's a Gentile's future. But the Jew, Psalm 146, verse 5, happy is he that hath the God of Jacob or the God of Israel for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. You see the difference there? Gentiles, no. Jews, yes. Okay? In life's journeys, the Gentiles had no assistance no true God to pray to, no help when problems came, a vacuum, empty life of meaninglessness. As Gentiles, they were lifeless, hopeless, covenantless, thus dead, darkened, devilish, and doomed. What an awful state to be in. That's the way it was. But since God has revealed to the Apostle Paul a new dispensation for the body of Christ today, now to us Gentiles or Jews, but to us Gentiles who believe in Christ, who believe he's the Son of God, who died for our sins, who was buried, who rose again, he's alive today. Those who believe that, now we have hope. What happened is Ephesians 2, verse 4 and 5. But God, Gentiles out, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. <clears throat> Even when we were dead in sins, lost Gentiles out there, hath quickened, raised, resurrected, made alive us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Verse 13 then. But now, not past, but now in Christ. Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off in time past, are made nigh by the blood 
of Christ. Amen. Amen. Once we were far off, now we're in God's family, near to his heart. Once we were condemned by sin, but now we've been justified, a right standing before God, forgiven all of our sins, past, present, future, been redeemed, set free, never to return to sin slavery ever again. Once without Christ, but now Christ lives in us. Once without hope, but now we're looking for the blessed hope. Once without covenants or promises, now we have great and precious promises that we can't even think about. Once we were without any inheritance, but now we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Once we were without spiritual life, but God breathed his life into our spirit to save us. And once we were without God, but now he's our father. And lastly, once deserving hell-bound sinners, but now we're a heaven-bound saint. That's what grace does. That's what the blood of Christ and the cross and the empty tomb accomplish. We don't have to be out there no more without any hope. Now today in the age of grace, the dispensation of grace, we have great hope if we believe in Christ. What a change. What a transition from Israel only to whosoever will today. Amen? I'm about done, so don't get nervous. The fact that today... Gentile or Jew can come to Christ by faith. Today was God's secret, the but now time, was God's secret, which he waited to reveal this truth until Paul. Paul was first. We Gentiles no longer have to be afar off from God. We no longer as Gentiles have to wait and go through Israel. But now we, we have access to Christ through faith in his finished work. What a different dispensation today is than the dispensation Israel only. And all of that was hid until he revealed it to our apostle Paul. Colossians 1.20 says this here, and having made peace through his blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, now get this, whether they be things in earth, the Israeli program, or things in heaven, the body of Christ program. Hello? Some of you will get that. Colossians 1.25 says this here, Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, the secret, which hath been hid from ages from generations, but now, hello, but now is made manifest to his saints. Amen. What a change. What a God. He didn't forget us. He had a purpose and a plan all the time. Now he has temporarily set Israel's side. Today it's the body of Christ time. It's the grace time. It's the gospel of grace time. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What a change, dispensationally. We're not in time past, Gentiles, no hope, no covenants, no God. We have him today. What a change personally. Do we realize the privilege that we have in being saved today when in ages past, Gentiles know after Genesis 11? Isn't that something? But today... We can be saved. We should appreciate the privilege we have if we're a child of God today. And lastly, I think, 
Now, if you're here this morning and you're not saved, you don't know where you're going to go when you do die, Jesus Christ is enough. Matter of fact, he's more than enough. Isn't that what they say? He's more than enough to take your sins away, breathe life into you, and guarantee one day to go to glory. That's your decision. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Say today, I'm going to believe in Christ and that gospel. It states in 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored, help thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul says, listen, if you want to be saved and not, you're not doomed to what it used to be. Today, this mystery program of grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ is available to anybody. All you need to do is, it's not about joining a church. It's not about baptism. It's not about giving your money. It's not about you doing all these works and religious things. No, it's just in your heart. You acknowledge, I know I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. But I believe that Jesus Christ and him alone is enough. He died for me, was buried and rose. I believe he and that is enough to save me. I believe it, God. Save me. Amen. And when you believe that, at that moment, God will save you. Let's bow our head and close our eyes. While you have your heads bowed, just right there where you're sitting, I'm not going to have you come forward, raise your I'm not doing that. But right where you sit, just tell God you believe him. Tell you believe in him, who he is, and what he's done for you on the cross and the empty tomb. He died for you. He was buried and rose. Say, God, I believe that's enough to save me. I believe. Just tell him right there where you are. And I promise you, according to the word of God, me, I'm nobody, but according to God's word, if you believe, you're saved. God, I want to thank you for the grace message. Thank you for the gospel of grace. What a time to be alive. What a time to be able to share this truth today. The doors are closing. We can see the end of this but now program coming to an end. And God, may we have as many people go with us when that trumpet sounds and we come up to be with you, seeing you face to face. What a privilege to be saved today, God. May we not neglect it. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said? We hope you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you visit with us in person. For more information, please visit our website at gpnd.net or contact us by phone at 317-535-3512. You can watch us live and view past services on our website, Facebook, or YouTube channel. Until next broadcast, may God richly bless you as our prayer.